Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, how much diversity is there in UK politics? We look at race, ethnicity and representation in the upcoming UK general election. So today's programme started with a tweet that somebody tweeted to me. I shared that with my producer. And then what happened, Malika Valau, our digital producer? Well, that tweet came from London and mm -hmm. we ran with it to make it into a show. So this is what we received. You can take a look at this map here to see it coming. This is from Nadira who says, I pitched a story to AJ Stream about diversity in the election using hashtag GE2015. They're featuring it tonight. So of course we want all of your opinions at home on this topic. You can use hashtag AJStream. Hi, I'm Sadiq Hamid. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Liverpool Health University and I'm in the stream. United Kingdom's Black and Ethnic Minority Communities, or BME, are now over 8 million people, equaling the population of Scotland and Wales combined. And as the UK's diversity continues to grow, ethnic minorities are projected to make up one third of the population by 2050. Their increase in numbers, though, don't match their political representation in Parliament. In the last general election, that was back in 2010, only 27 candidates of ethnic minority backgrounds succeeded in becoming members of Parliament. That's 27 seats out of a total of 650. Now, to be representative of the UK's diversity, an estimated 117 candidates would need to win on Thursday, May the 7th. So, will the next parliament be more representative of the general public? To help us talk about this, we're joined by Simon Woolley. He's founder of Operation Black Vote. That's a group working to ensure greater racial justice and equality throughout the UK. Pamjit Dandra is a former UK Member of Parliament. Elsa McQuazy is a writer with Spite magazine, that's an online current affairs publication. And Omar Khan is director of the Ronnie Mead Trust, that's an independent race equality think tank. So great to have you all here in the mix, everybody. Let's start with Pamjit. Pamjit, there are going to be people who are going to take issue with the idea that we're equating the connection between politics and colour why does it even matter? Shouldn't it just be about the issues, not about the colour of the person who's representing you or the colour of the constituency? Shouldn't it be just about the politics? What's your response to It that? should be about the politics. Yeah. But good politics is made with a variety of opinions. If you have a parliament that is overwhelmingly white, male, uh, upper and middle class, you don't make the best policies for a country as diverse as the United Kingdom in uh, the year 2015. Uh, and you're quite right, the country's changing fast by the year 2050. It won't be 14, 15 percent uh, BME, it will be nearer a third. Um, so um, we have a debate in this country not just about politics, we have it about the civil service, we have it about private sector boards, we have it about people in the higher echelons of the police. You name it, so right the way across the board. But I think we've kind of worked out that diversity is a good thing. And if all the different groups in our country are not represented uh, in every level of society, not just at the bottom, but at the top yeah. as well, then um, we won't be the kind of country that we should be and we won't make good policy. Elsa, are you convinced by that argument? Um, well, I slightly, I think it is. it should definitely be about the politics and when we start looking at characteristics too much, whether it's, you know, the colour of skin, whether it's our gender, then we sort of draw away from the main issues as you mentioned in your statement and we focus more on our identity more so than what these potential candidates have to offer us. So um, I think that representation in Parliament is essential and it's necessary but the representation of ideas is what needs to win rather than you know just solely focusing on the characteristics. Did you know how many MPs from minorities that were actually serving in the UK Parliament right now before I t mentioned it on the show? Elsa? Yes, 27. Yeah. Yes. You're okay with that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that there's definitely um, scope for more representation. But you just um, argued more... you just argued against the scope though, Elsa, right? Politics no, 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 is more I didn't argue... Politics is more important, uh -huh. but what I'm saying is that 
just because you are of a certain color or of a certain race, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only reason why people should vote for you. Sure. I'd argue that these um, the candidates, the BME candidates who would like to become MPs, um, should all obviously have um, issues which their constituents um, agree with and want to vote for. That's what I'm saying. Well, Simon, there is someone online who agrees with Elsa. I want to read you this tweet from Brass. He says, color is irrelevant. What I want depends on who I am, where I live, and what I want. Color doesn't decide any vote. But then you get pushback like this from members of, of the UK. This is Ito who says, it is very hard to relate to people who don't look like you or even relate to your everyday life, rich, white, and male. I am not. So what do you make of that, uh, Simon, that, that discrepancy there? Sure. Well, I, I'm sure that a lot of your uh, viewers in Baltimore will say that colour matters, that race race matters. I mean, Elsa mentioned ideas, but what if those ideas uh, don't address race inequality? The shocking levels of unemployment here in the UK for young black men uh, has gone up by 50 percent. And uh, in the same at the same time, unemployment for young white youths has gone down by 2 percent. Uh, so, you know, it's I, I'm sorry that Elsa doesn't see that the tackling race inequality matters. Of course, it's not either or. You know, we're not saying it's just about representation or it's just about the ideas. It's both. They both influence each other. And when they do, then you have policies that actually work for all communities and society, business and politics works better for that diversity. Elsa? Um, yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, of course I am for racial equality. And my point is actually that racial equality is not necessarily just a, an issue that BME politicians can um, put to the forefront, but that all politicians should put to the forefront. That's a universalist perspective, well, and it's the, not well, solely, um, it's not, well, reality, so, it should not, it should not solely be the, um, the, the fight for BME politicians, which should be the fight of all politicians. And so when I do speak about ideas, you know, I speak about ideas on a broad spectrum, ideas that everybody can relate to, not just because you are black or Asian, the trouble but is, because you the are... The trouble is with Elsa's ideas. Yeah. The trouble is with Elsa's ideas yeah. is that in the, last, in the last five years or so, actually those ideas have not begun to tackle race inequality. And so those inequality gaps have got wider and not closed. The, the, the point about it is, I guess it's the same whether you're talking about race or gender. Uh, if, if it's not on the spectrum, it's not being dealt with. And if it's not being dealt with, actually things get worse. Mm. And, you know, it's a shame when you have a, a, a black writer that, you know, we want more black writers. I mean, I think Elsa should go to some of our uh, media uh, outlets and she won't see many people that look like her. Uh, I would argue that if you talk about race as part of the discourse, then we'll have greater representation. So Elsa can go and ply a uh, trade in outlets that at the moment uh, are completely and utterly unrepresentative. But I don't think we should lose the sight on these elections. These elections are really important for the diversity of this country. And, and what we're saying in Operation Black Vote, that actually we can decide who wins and who loses. And with that leverage, we're saying to all the political parties <coughs> to have a plan to tackle race inequality. And then actually you are ensuring that the talent in your, on your island can flourish, which benefits everyone. Simon, let me just play a little clip from one of the Operation Black Vote campaign. I'm, I'm going to call it an ad. Um, it, yeah. It's incredibly powerful and people reacted to it in, in a big way. This is the actor David Harewood. If you watch Homeland, yes. you'll recognise him. Um, and I'm just going to say, have a look at this. I've done some fantastic things in my career, but one of the best things I've ever done is register to vote. Because if you're black or Asian and you're not registered to vote, you're actually taking the colour out of Britain. And quite frankly, that looks ridiculous. Now, I know you don't feel represented by politicians. The thing is, if you're not registered, then they won't ever listen. It's a chicken and egg. Omar, when you saw Operation Black Vote, the, these very visual campaigns, what was your reaction? Well, I thought it was a positive campaign. Um, mm. We've got a lot of data on registration, but obviously telling people that black African people are four times less likely to be registered 
that Pakistanis are three times, uh, two to three times less likely to be registered. Those statistics don't always move people actually to do something. So, uh, you know, I work for an organization that tries to proffer statistics about what Simon was talking about earlier. But we do need to engage young people to make sure that they they understand that those statistics have a real impact on their lives. The other thing about registration that I don't think people understand is the way that we draw constituency boundaries, how many people are in each MPC, is on the basis of registered populations. Ah, ah. So if you don't register, it also means all of your neighbors will be impacted in terms of the power of their vote. So if you think it's just a sort of individual choice, what you have to understand is if you live in an area with a lot of black people, a lot of Asian people, and you think, you know, these politicians don't say anything for you know, for me, yeah. the impact of that in the next election when they re redraw constituency boundaries is that your grandmother and your aunt and your sister, all of them will lose their voting power too. I mean, the other thing I'd like to say is that it's not just a theory about whether or not black and Asian people have different interests. There was a survey in the 2010 general election that asked people, what was your number one reason for voting? Yeah. And black and Asian people were uh, put unemployment at the top. It was their number one issue, and it wasn't the case for white British people. There were other attitudinal questions as well, and black and minority ethnic people answer those questions mm. differently. So it's not some sort of question of identity versus politics. People, a lot of black and Asian people have different politics. They think that unemployment matters. They think that discrimination matters. And they don't think that because of some sort of abstract thing that they read in reports that I write. It's because they experience it in life. They know that they're brothers, their sisters, their cousins have to send in twice as many CVs just to get an interview if they have an Asian or African sounding surname. So I think this distinction that's been drawn between politics and identity is, is actually not correct. People vote because of issues that matter to them, yes, but those matters are real and they're political questions. Right. We need a, a government that responds to racial inequalities. It's been decades and more that these inequalities have persisted. Well, Parmashid, I want your thoughts on this, especially being a former member of parliament. We actually received a comment from another former member of parliament. He was um, a member of the Conservative Party, a former local councillor. He, he writes in, casual racism and the more pernicious and active discrimination is clearly evident within the Conservative Party from top to bottom. So when we're talking about representation and making sure that minority candidates are represented when it comes time to vote and then to be voted in, what was your experience? Well, I've just written a book about it called My Political Race, actually. Um, and in it, I talk about some of the things that I think perhaps Elsa, without wanting to get on Elsa's back here, because we're not all criticising Elsa, I agree with what she's saying in terms of policy matters, regardless of your background. But I think what she ignores here is um, some of the barriers, Elsa, that actually hold back BME people from being getting into politics in the first place. Um, I mean, one of the things I talk about is my experience as a 29-year-old young man, as I was back in the year 2001, being elected for a white constituency in Middle England, in Gloucester, a wonderful place. The people there took a chance on me, but that sort of thing doesn't happen very often. And if you look at some of the things that happened at that time, the local newspaper wrote an article saying the people of Gloucester haven't reached a sufficiently advanced state of consciousness to accept the foreigner as their local MP foreigner. Yes, I grew up in West London. I suppose that's foreign to some people. <laughs> but there were, uh, and even the night I was selected, um, I had to beat uh, over 90 people to win the selection. And um, they just read the result. And I went up to the microphone. I was delighted. And people came up to me and hugged me. And somebody came up to me, shook my hand. I said, well, thank you for your support. He said, no, 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 no. Well done. You were the best. But I couldn't vote for you because I just assumed that we'd lose the seat because this is a white area and you're not a white person. So mm. Elsa, there, there are a whole variety of barriers that mm. I think we're becoming increasingly aware of. Um, post the McPherson report, when then we had the terrible, terrible murder of Stephen Lawrence in the 1990s, it made us look at ourselves and our institutions and look at barriers. But I don't think, looking at the statistics, we've moved anything like far enough in terms of representation or, and diversity in Parliament. 27 um, um, members of Parliament who are not white out of 650, when it should be, you know, nearer 100, is frankly a, a travesty. And that means we have to look at those barriers and what is holding people back. It's not just a case of 
people from ethnic minority backgrounds aren't good enough because that's just not the case. I Pandit, meet people I'm out just there looking, all the time who make great Pandit, give me give me a moment because I'm looking at uh, your website here and you're standing there in the Houses of Parliament. Um, you stand out, you stand out in Gloucester, which is almost a, a exclusively white community. How did you do it? Like what you did should be a model for yeah. everywhere else if you're trying to increase the number of minority politicians, yeah. right? How, how did you do it? What was your trick? You'll have to read the book. Oh, OK. <laughs> so, all right, all right. Listen, oh, no, he's always a politician. He might be retired. One of the problems with me having done it <laughs> yeah, in go the on. first place was yeah. I think uh, a lot of people said, well, look at Palmjit Danda in yeah. Gloucester. Oh, it happened right. there so it can happen everywhere. Anyway, yes. And in some ways, looking back 15 years later, right. I think to myself, well, maybe in some ways it was detrimental to the cause because no, when oh, people oh, see really? uh, a black face or, uh, or a brown face on the news from a political party, whether it's Sajid Javid or Chukka Ramuna or whether it's Keith Paz, yeah. people perhaps start to think everything is okay and, and rosy these are, in the these garden. Are all quite well known but there minority isn't a phalanx of people the behind them. That's, that's the problem. There should be many more. All right, let me, let's go via my laptop and then over to the community. So I just want to show you something here. Since 1987, this is when you first got the first minority uh, politicians in Parliament, there were four. And then each year, there was a general election, goes up. Four, six, nine, 12, 15. And then in 2010, we have 27 non-white politicians. So we're looking ahead to see what might happen this year. Malika, What's the community saying about well, the conversation? Sonia, I want to pick up on the question that you asked yeah. Parmajit, how he did it. Yes. Because online we have, this is a, a comment from someone who says this is how it could be done. So mm. I want you all to have a listen to Lee. The level of black and ethnic minority representation in British democracy is a disgrace. Uh, it's nowhere near reflective of the country at large. And it provides for huge tensions within communities because when black and ethnic minorities uh, don't see themselves represented in the corridors of power, they believe democracy is not for them. Uh, and that's why I think we need black-only shortlists uh, for all parties in order to make up this shortfall. So Elsa, you don't look convinced. What do you think of his idea for black-only shortlists? Well, I think um, the idea of black-only shortlists, again, just very much focuses on the characteristics of the politicians and will not necessarily look at their their policies. Um, I think when we think of issues that affect, let's say, predominantly black um, people, let's say, uh, for example, um, stop and search, um, that in itself shouldn't necessarily be categorized as an issue that can only be dealt um, by black uh, BME candidates or... See, see any... Elsa, see, I, I live in South London. I lived in South London. Yeah. You live in South so London. So do I, yeah. So you, you know that sometimes young black youth get stopped because they're young black youth. Now, if you're not from that community, how do you understand that and make policy about that to maybe help that discrimination not happening? I speak here as a South Londoner taking off my co-host yes. hat just for a second. <laughs> now I've got to put it back on. No worries. No how, worries. how do you respond to that? Well, I think that is injustice and injustice. But how do no you color. understand that, Elsa, unless you come from that community? Because when you see okay. that people are, when you even hear about people that are being discriminated against because of their colour, it doesn't, you do not have to be black to understand that that is you wrong. You don't, but it really helps, right, Simon? Okay. Simon. What's yes, no, I'm, again, I'm disappointed. You're disappointed. I mean, just, That's just the face well, of disappointment just, just staring levels, back really. there. Just, just, All right, let me move no, things on I'm a little bit because we're, we're getting just, a very can circular... I, point I mean, can I come in? Uh, yeah, go can ahead. Can I just give an, come in with an example? Yeah, go uh, and pond uh, it, uh, and then Omar. Yeah, um, I, I was lucky enough to be uh, Minister for the UK's Fire and Rescue Service uh, when I uh, was an MP. Um, we, we made a conscious decision because the fire service was overwhelmingly white and male to double the number of women coming into the fire service and massively increase the number of people from ethnic minority backgrounds. As a consequence of that, the culture change of the fire and rescue service. We were doing a lot more with, for example, Somali women in London uh, and talking to them face to face, people from their own communities talking to them because they tend to have long drapey dresses, they cook with hot oils and a lot of 
fires were caused off the back of that in London. We reduced the number of fire deaths. We created better policy through being more like the people whose lives we were trying to save. Mm. That's just one example of the difference that it makes having a more diverse, but, um, I mean, the other in point that is, case, Pondit, fire and rescue service. Pondit. Go ahead, Simon. Pondit, the other point is, is that Elsa's argument and, and, and the cohort at, at Spike they bang on about this thing about we don't want identity politics. Identity politics is bad and get stuck in that groove. Well, if you never had some sort of identity politics, you wouldn't close the gender inequality. You wouldn't deal with disability. You wouldn't be deal with a gay and lesbian inequalities. You have to identify what the problem is if you're going to solve it. This whole thing about, oh, it's all about ideas. It's all universal. It's just claptrap. And it's very sad because, of course, uh, when you don't do that, of course, things either stay the same or, or get worse. Uh, what we say is, is that actually by, by acknowledging and then dealing with it, actually eventually you won't have to bang on about it because you will have dealt with it. But the, 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 there is a real necessity, one, to acknowledge it and two, to have a plan to deal with it. That's why we did with these adverts. We wanted to do a meaningful metaphor when we painted these stars white. We said it was a, a, a metaphor that, that said, unless our communities get involved, then you take our dynamism, you take our diversity, our <coughs> energy out of the equation. So if you want, if you want dynamic politics, business, uh, 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 institutions, then they must have a, a right. filter so you can have that great team in diversity. Sure. There, there was a comment a little bit earlier on that came in from our online community that, that said certain things about the Conservative Party and the reputation that they have had. Yeah. Now, let's fast forward to David Cameron talking about minority politicians and the future, and maybe that commenter might want to adjust what they're feeling. I think this is a really important comment to add to the mix. Have a listen to Prime Minister David Cameron right here. 15%, almost one in five of retirement seats, that's where a sitting Conservative MP is standing down, seats that we have, a, as it were, a very good chance of keeping, we have black, Asian or minority ethnic candidates. But I think we can go further. And so in the next election, 2020, I want that to reach 20% of those retirement seats. And why not? We are the first party to have a female Prime Minister. We were the party of the first Jewish Prime Minister. And I know one day we're going to be the party of the first black or Asian Prime Minister. It might even be someone right here in this room. And I look forward to that day in our country. Interesting. In our lifetimes, that will be interesting happening. Uh, meanwhile, what's happening back online? What's the conversation going on there? Malika? They're moving it towards how do you get people to vote? We've had this great conversation. How do you mm. then uh, make it happen mm. on the street? So this is Shane who says, if we seem disengaged with these elections, GE 2015, it's because politics disengaged with us a long time ago. And this other person writes in, this is Nishman. She says, mm. currently it's bad yeah, because ethnic minorities need to feel like they have a reason to vote. And currently, Femi, they're saying they don't feel like they have a reason to vote. Mm -hmm. Pamdi, what would you say to people who are thinking, ah, maybe I will, maybe I won't vote next week, Thursday the 7th? What yeah, would you say to them? Well, firstly, I can, I can understand why sometimes people feel a, a sense of yeah. demoralization or that they, you know, they are uh, a relatively small fish in a bigger pond here. Yeah, in, in but, a sense, um, it's Palm Jay, because we're wrapping up this part of the conversation before we go well, online. You, you, look, your you can't change would anything unless you get involved. You can't actually right. make a difference yeah. at all. If, if there'd never been a Barack Obama, Obama, if there'd never been a Nelson Mandela, would the world yeah. be a better place? I don't think it would. Interesting. Simon, in a sentence for next Thursday, what would you say? Oh, no, ab ab no absolutely. No, listen, it's a great opportunity. And uh, actually, we can make a difference. We can, we can exercise our franchise and demand greater race yeah. equality. Elsa, I'm really curious. Are you voting next week? <laughs> well, I'm actually French, so I can't vote in oh! race. <laughs> She's given us this awful hard time, and the woman can't even get out there and vote. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Elsa, Omar, be, Pandit, be, um... Simon, we are taking you all to the post show, stream.aljazeera.com. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's not over yet. See you in the post show online. On our next show, we'll be discussing the Mediterranean migrant crisis and how Europe is responding to it. I'll see you online. Take care.
Hello, welcome back. This is the Streams Online Post Show. We've been talking about ethnic diversity in UK politics and whether or not minorities are adequately re represented in Parliament. So I, I want to start back here on my laptop. This is Operation Black Vote. These are the MPs so far who come from non-white backgrounds, OK? So if I scroll down, it literally takes me less than 30 seconds. This is, this is all of them. There we go. All of them. Uh, Simon, how, uh, how do you go about changing that? What, what's, the, yes. what's, what's the method that you're using? So, well, there's got to be, yeah, well, there's got to be a massive cultural change within, mm. within the political parties. But actually, I think that the, the biggest change will be when ordinary people, black or white, yeah. begin to reclaim democracy. Because, you know, in the programme, you said people say they're, they're turned off. And we took a bus around the country and had a conversation with tens of thousands of people who said similar things. And we said, look, we know what you're, what you're feeling. They don't look like us, they don't sound like us, mm. and they don't address the concerns that we care about. Yeah. And we say that's precisely why you should get involved. Right. And when we do that, particularly in those marginal seats, we can begin to make the demands on political parties to uh, have greater representation. Mm. And, and one thing I would say, though, that it's not just about it's not just about black faces in yeah. high places yeah. because you can have black faces in high places who don't care about race equality. It's about both the black faces and those that care about race equality. The two things together is a powerful cocktail. Sure. And I should have said this earlier because by black, you mean political black. You don't mean literally Afro-Caribbean. You're talking about all non-white no. communities. Non-white. Non right. Non non-white communities because all those non-white communities face a particular type of uh, inequality because of their color of their skin their often their uh, foreign uh, sounding name all of those things build on prejudice right this is a major structural change you're suggesting palmjit is is it realistic or is it just going to take a I long time I, I mean i showed those numbers starting at four non-white MPs in 1987, now we have 27. That's a really long time. It's a slog, right? It is. We're all going to be dead Especially by the time you... we get 100, probably. We are, and, and, and as you said earlier on, society is changing. Society is changing yeah. very quickly as yeah. well, a third by, by the year 2050. So uh, where does that leave us? I think Lee Jasper threw in a really uh, interesting question about whether we need um all black shortlist it's worked in the labor party for women mm -hmm. uh, we will have a parliamentary labor party of over 40 percent women at uh, this general election if it's good enough to do that for women is it not a bad idea to do the same for racial diversity i think that that is a question that needs to be considered i also think that the targets that david cameron is talking about you know i don't care which parties are doing it the more of it the better I think these are these are measures that we've got to get behind and support. So, in terms Pange, of, so the, say, say there were like 50 MPs that are all from non-white backgrounds and they were all conservatives. You'd be OK with that? Uh, no, I wouldn't, because I want all parties to progress on this. Actually. Right. Historically, the Labour Party uh, is the party that BME communities have looked to. They certainly did from when my parents came from India in the 1960s. Uh. Uh, I, it's very much the same with other diverse and ethnic minority communities in the UK. They've historically looked to the Labour Party. So, yes, we've got to lead on this and set an example. But I want to see the other parties actually making huge strides as well. I, I really welcome that. Omar, I want to bring you in here with this idea from someone online. This is on Twitter. Brain Food says, I feel that politicians have largely ignored the black vote until the very last minute. And of course, we're, we're extending black vote to the minority vote as well. And they go on to say, we are often the target, not the supported in this election. So how do you go about making communities feel like they're not just being talked to, they're being uh, included? Yes, I can understand that that view. I mean, the the manifestos came out and they didn't have a lot in them. And then, you know, the Labour uh, did produce a Black and Asian minority ethnic manifesto after the main manifesto. And um, similarly, David Cameron has made this commitment, which is a good thing. But it was made, you know, two weeks into the campaign. I think realizing that he was going to lose eight to ten seats uh, that are the most diverse conservative seats. So, you know, it's. I think the challenge is not just in the manifesto writing, not just in the campaigning, you know, in the three to four weeks up to the election, but, you know, both during while you're in power, while you're in government, passing policies that, that, that target racial inequalities, that reduce stop and search, that improve labor market outcomes, 
Um, and even while you're in the opposition, like the Labour Party, um, you know, c shouting out a bit more about these things as well. You didn't really hear the Labour Party or the, you know, the Liberal Democrats, uh, the coalition partner, any of the parties saying that much about racial uh, inequality during five years, the last five years. And so you can understand, therefore, why um, voters, black and Asian young people in particular. I did want to pick that point up. I think the other reason why this will start, hopefully, to become an issue uh, more is because those demographics. But there has been a lag historically because of the younger age of the black and minority ethnic population. So although it's 14% of the population, it's only 10% of the electorate because they're too young to vote. Right. And so that, when do you think is going to be the key year then, Omar? Is there, there going to be like a sweet spot? Yeah, I think I think the issue for the parties is if they start, you know, if they do it too late, they'll they'll find out what the Republicans found out in the U.S. Um, you have to start making commitments now. But by 2020, 2025, you're going to be seeing not just inner London seats where this is affecting. You're going to see 150 seats with 25 percent plus BME populations. And that's going to mean that every kind of politician in the typical English seat, in an urban Scottish seat, even in uh, seats in Cardiff and in, in, in sub suburban Wales, those politicians are going to have to respond. But one of the things it really requires is that young black and minority ethnic people do get out and vote, do register to vote. I mean, that's an argument also, uh, arguably, for reducing the voting age to 16, which is there's more, um, you know, that's about, that population is 20 to 25 percent black and minority ethnic. So obviously there's one in four voters potentially to win. Simon, what did you want to add? No, I w I very much I would agree with that. And I think actually, though, I would say that we could see greater success even next year, because next year we have the the mayoral elections here in the capital in, in London and uh, yes. almost uh, one in three is from a minority background. I, I predict with a bit of luck we could see the first uh, black mayor for London and you know London's a city state so it would be Sarah, a Sarah, big Sarah, hold, hold up a minute. So who, who, do you a think, mayor. Who, who do you think it will be this black mayor of London? <laughs> Well, there's a number. Are you well, running? Well, there's a number of candidates that could that could easily win. Right. Uh, uh, there is uh, there is uh, Dine Abbott. Yes. Dine Abbott, of course. Yeah. Uh, Sadiq Khan, David David Lammy, and there's a footballer now, Sol Campbell. He could put his hat in the ring. Oh so my goodness, it's getting more and more like American four, politics. Very, very good candidate, but uh, the symbolism, right. particularly if they're good, you know, good quality, yeah. would be fantastic on a global scale. Right. Interesting. I did what. Watch this face. I didn't want to pick up. Yeah, Omar, go ahead. Well, I didn't, I didn't actually respond to all of that comment online, yeah. which was around UKIP. And I think there is a, a significant question there. Do politicians think there's more votes to lose uh, to an anti-immigrant sentiment than there are votes to gain from black and minority ethnic people? And, you know, I think politicians have played a little bit of a... They, they should be more careful in their, their, migrant, their attitudes around migrants because we know this affects not just migrant born populations which should not be you know the target of such hostile rhetoric but also it affects uh, black and Asian people who are born in Britain who are then told you know why don't you go home and the effects of that rhetoric are, are quite quite significant and I suppose that is what I'm, I'm trying to say here to, to, to viewers is that if young people don't register to vote if they don't get out you know those numbers won't you know, politicians will continue to think just like the Republicans thought that there's more votes to lose to a certain kind of uh, older white voter than there are votes to get, to win from young black and minority ethnic voters. And I, I think it's really important that we, we get our voices out there and that, that, that we're heard. I just want to share some statistics with uh, Elsa. This is the 2010 turnout, Elsa, right here on my laptop. So 67% of that turnout were white voters, 51% were non-white voters. So obviously non-white voters were not engaged enough to turn out. How much of an issue do you, th do you think that is? How would you interpret that? What's going on? Oh, I, oh, um, I definitely think that not enough um, political turnout is, you know, is, is a bad thing that needs to be addressed. And I'd say that the campaign um, Operation Black Vote is, um, is, leaning, is leading in terms of voter registration in itself. You know, I oh, think so, so you, you like Operation Black Vote, Elsa? I'm yeah. saying that their um, initiatives to get people more engaged is... It's quite, it's, it's quite good. Ooh. But um, I would okay. say... OK, that's nice. But, um, I would say... <laughs> also and Simon in slightly agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I'd say that in terms of, shame. um, you know, it, in terms of um, actually getting people to vote, um, you know, registration is, you know, one step 
and yeah. it's you know it's almost a technical solution and there you know needs to be more engagement when you talk about engagement it's not just you know the technical engagement of actually writing your name down and signing and voting um sorry registering to vote but it's you know looking at the ideas of why you want to why, vote why do you and say when, that when, why do you say um, Elsa, why do you say it's technical? Yeah. Why do you say it's technical when we've got a black manifesto? There's nothing technical about tackling no. race inequality. Why do you say no. that? No, I'm not saying that tackling race inequality is technical. I'm saying that when you register to vote, that's one step. But then you actually need to turn out and vote. And I'm arguing no, but the reason that... Why you register to, the reason why you register to vote, the reason why you register to vote is so you can have a voice to tackle race inequality. Yes, but if then you, you don't also register to vote, then the politicians will not tackle race inequality because you cannot decide who wins but and who all, loses. Not all those who are registered actually vote. But if you so don't they're... register, Elsa, you can't vote. So I'm just going to put a exactly. full stop on that bit of the conversation because it's going round and round in a circle. All right, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you register, you vote. That's one step. Elsa, what else do you have as yeah. your suggestion? Because you're, you're, you're not... You're not buying into this idea of quotas. You're not that keen on uh, engaging the non-white potential electorate with non-white potential politicians. How else would you address this? Because well, it feels to me like you've, you're living in this idealistic world, which isn't quite where you live. No, for me, um, actually, I'd say that, again, I'd go back to the policies, and for me, in terms of, you know, just... Whose policies do you like right the, now? For example, let me, um, let's just say uh, the immigration policies. Right. I think that there hasn't been a, enough diversity in um, in the different, with, with what the different parties are offering. Why you know, do you I'd think say, that might be? Do you think it might be because, well, about what we're talking about today, perhaps? Yeah, I, I, I do think that uh, the uh, point that you mentioned that yeah. was uh, um, highlighted by one of your um, viewers yeah. that it's only when UKIP started talking about immigration that the other party started to slightly address it, but not actually tackle it full on. I think if you engage with uh, policies full on, you know, it's not necessarily focusing on, um, you know, the characteristics again, which is, you know... All right, so point. we're coming full circle with your argument. We hear it loud and clear, and you made it very well during this Can I, uh, can I come in just on... Omar, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> No, I was going to say one thing in support of Elsa, just uh, to give her a, a little support as well, that it is true that white MPs who represent more diverse seats are more likely to raise uh, issues of, of race and equality. Yeah. So there is, you know, it is true that if you're a white MP uh, in a seat that has a large black and minority ethnic population, when you look at questions asked in Parliament, when you look at, um, you know, uh, issues that they raise uh, with their constituents, they are more likely to understand those issues. However, uh, a sort of contrary p bit of evidence, which picks up something that Parmjeet said, uh, Parmjeet Danda said, is that there's also evidence that uh, black and Asian candidate does lose two to four percent of the vote. Mm. So this idea that voters uh, might not vote for you if you're black and minority ethnic isn't, again, sure. just an old issue or a theoretical issue. Yeah. In 2010, there was a study that showed you lose between two and four percent of the vote if you're black and minority, which all sort of goes just against because of the way saying. you look. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And that so I don't know whether you helped saying. Elsa or you, you, you solidified yeah. the case against her, but I, I like hearing those competing bits of studies there. OK, uh, Palmjit, you are not allowed to hold up your book again, but I do want <laughs> to hear, what was it like for you <laughs> being one of the few in uh, UK Parliament? What was that experience like? I was just going to say, following Omar's point, yes, yeah. White MPs in diverse areas may be good at taking up BME issues. I like to think I was very, very good at taking up white issues. Actually, right. spent a lot of my time on white working class right. estates. Yeah. Uh, did you feel um, welcome? Did you feel? Live in did you feel part of the infrastructure? I did. I did. Good. I felt very much a part of things. I felt very much good. I was an outsider to the city, but I made it yeah. my home, uh, and uh, I felt very much at one with the people that lived there. But I never forgot where I came from either. Right. So, um, and, and I really think we need to put that whole issue of this, you, you do slightly worse by two to four yeah. percent behind us. Because and why? political parties from the top need to lead and say, we're going to do what's right. Ah. We're going to choose the best candidate. And if they just concentrate in every case in choosing the best candidate, then they will have more 
BME candidates wow. selected. Pamji, that's a that's a big ask. To help them come through. Yeah, that's a that's a big ask. Okay, um, Malika. I will end, wrap us up. I will end with this. This is from Lee Jasper, who's well known in the UK among some circles. I know one of our guests already uh, mentioned his comment that he sent in earlier. I want to leave us with this Facebook comment he wrote us. He said, the time when the BME vote could be ignored or taken for granted is gone. Britain will indeed elect the first black prime minister at some point before 2030. And so, of course, you heard it. 2030. First. I'm just adding up to see if I'll be dead by then. No, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be still alive. Simon Woolley, Pamjit Dundra, Elsa McQuasey, Omar Khan, thank you for being in this conversation. We really appreciate it. Many thanks indeed for being part of the stream today. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.